In this video, I want to explain how to correctly test for copper toxicity. There's a lot of confusion on this topic, which is why we will go over both blood tests and hair analysis, talk about what to look for on each, and why low copper levels don't automatically mean you don't have copper toxicity. It's still widely believed that copper toxicity is very rare and only happens in people with Wilson's disease. Wilson's disease is a genetic condition that affects your body's ability to eliminate copper, and it is linked to the ATP7B gene mutation. I don't want to talk about that in this video. Instead, I want to talk about how to test for copper toxicity outside of Wilson's disease. So when your ATP7B gene is fine, but you still accumulate excess copper in the wrong places. I explain the condition in much more detail in a different video, but what you have to understand is that this type of copper toxicity is extremely common, especially in people with chronic fatigue, anxiety, and estrogen dominance. The reason for it is that biounavailable copper can block your energy pathway, it retains estrogen, and it also converts dopamine to adrenaline. It's one of the fundamental nutrient imbalances you need to fix to recover. The reason it's often not spotted has to do with bad testing and many practitioners not knowing what to look for. So let me show you how to test for it correctly, both on blood tests and also on hair analysis. The following lesson is taken from my Copper Toxicity Masterclass, which is part of my recovery program, where I walk you through the symptoms, diagnosis and recovery step by step. Make sure to check it out if you need more guidance. Great, now that you know what copper toxicity is and its wide range of symptoms, it's time to talk about testing. How exactly do you test for it and find out whether or not you have copper issues and if so, how bad they are? Let's start off with blood tests. Blood tests by themselves are not great for spotting copper toxicity because the excess copper is found in the tissue, not the blood. Like I said before, the copper overload in your organs often also comes with a deficiency in the blood. My first blood test was the perfect example of this and it showed a copper deficiency, after which I was told to supplement copper. This would have made my symptoms a lot worse and I'm glad I didn't. Of course, sometimes you do get lucky and the person has high copper blood levels. This usually happens when the copper overload is fairly new or when the body can still keep copper in circulation, so bioavailable. However, the weaker the body gets and the more overloaded the liver becomes, the higher the likelihood of seeing a copper deficiency on a blood test. What that means is that copper blood tests, be it serum or whole blood tests, are really only good for evaluating bioavailability, so how well your body can transport copper around but they're not a good indicator of total body levels. You generally want to evaluate it together with ceruloplasmin, the copper transport protein. For example, the Walsh protocol does work with blood tests to check for copper toxicity, but they use tighter than normal ranges and also look at ceruloplasmin, zinc, and calculate free copper. Here are the ideal ranges that they use. For serum copper, anything between 70 and 110, for plasma zinc, anything between 90 and 135, for ceruloplasmin between 19 and 39, for free copper anything between 5 and 15 would be considered ideal and above 15 would be considered high, and for free copper percentage ideal would be less than 10%, 10 to 20 can be considered normal and above 20% is considered high. Basically, what you would do if you wanted to use just blood tests is to check if one, you have outright high copper, so if your blood copper is elevated, two, if you have a low zinc, because normal copper and low zinc would still mean a relative copper overload, three, if you have low ceruloplasmin, which would mean your body cannot keep copper bioavailable. Walsh's range of 19 to 39 is fairly broad and I know practitioners that see anything under 30 as low already, so keep that in mind. The problem with ceruloplasmin testing is that it's not just a copper transport protein, but also an acute phase protein, which means it will rise during acute infections. So just checking if ceruloplasmin is high enough isn't ideal either. 
That's why looking at all your tests together is so important. And four, if you have free copper. To calculate free copper, your ceruloplasmin is multiplied by three. And this value is then subtracted from the total serum copper level. So for example, if your ceruloplasmin is 20 and your serum copper is 100, you times the 20 by three and subtract that from 100 to get 40, which would be a fairly high free copper value. You can also calculate this free copper as a percentage of total copper by dividing your free copper by your total copper, which would then give us 40% free copper, which again is very high. As you can see from this example, even though your copper was technically within the normal range, because of your low ceruloplasmin and high free copper, you would still be classified as having too much unbound free copper and a copper issue. So if you dive deep into blood testing and know what to look for, you can get a lot of insights from it. But most practitioners don't know what to look for. And this method also only works when your excess copper is still somewhat bioavailable, so showing up in the blood. But you do also sometimes have people that have low to normal serum copper and normal ceruloplasmin, but are still copper toxic. In such a case, blood tests are much more misleading and won't show us the true extent of the problem. This is where hair testing comes into play. If you do a properly done hair analysis, so one from one of the two labs that I recommend, you will be able to spot copper toxicity very effectively. The ideal copper level is 2.5 mg percent with an okay range between 1 and 2.5. But even if your test shows this level, you can still have excess and or biounavailable copper. The great thing about hair testing is that there are so-called hidden copper toxicity markers. These are markers that basically always correlate with copper toxicity or a bioavailability problem, even when the copper value itself is normal. So to check for hidden copper toxicity on a hair test, you want to look for the following. A slow oxidizer pattern by itself or together with a low copper, a four lows pattern, which means calcium, magnesium, sodium, and potassium are below their ideal values, a calcium shell, which means the calcium value is above 170, a sodium potassium ratio below 2.5, a sympathetic dominance pattern, which means potassium is less than five, low zinc less than 13, an imbalanced zinc copper ratio, so anything far of the ideal ratio of eight to one, or high mercury above 0.035. Basically what the labs found was that every time someone had one or more of these markers, chances are very high that the person also has a copper issue. The reason their copper hair level might look normal is because that person's body cannot eliminate the excess copper effectively. So the reading stays within the normal range. Once you improve that person's nutrient levels and their energy, the copper will start to be dumped. And often on a retest, the copper level spikes. Okay, to wrap up this lesson, let's quickly recap the most important learnings. Basically, blood tests alone will just tell you how much copper is in the blood being transported around. It does not tell you about your total body levels. Together with zinc, ceruloplasmin, and your free copper values, you can get a somewhat better picture, but this still only works if your body is able to mobilize some of its copper. Hair testing gives us a better view of total body load since it's a tissue test. You can either spot copper toxicity directly through the copper value or by looking for one or more of the hidden copper indicators that I just gave you.